It is time to go deeper in God's Word. It's time to engage in truth. Here is Dr. Steve Ford and Pastor John Bornshee. You're listening to Engage in Truth, and we're so happy that you've joined us today. This is Steve Ford, your co-host, along with Pastor John Bornsheen, Senior Pastor at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley here in beautiful Colorado Springs, Colorado. Well, moving on from our History of the Bible series and the Where's of Pastor John, we're going to get all science-y today. <laughs> as a reminder, the prior episodes of the broadcast, as well as other helpful content, are archived for your review on the church's website at calvaryfountain.com. That's Calvary Fountain. Com. Well, Pastor John and I were discussing Psalm 103 and verse 12, where it reads, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Notice that this would not work as well had it said, As far as the north is from the south, since at some point heading north, you begin heading south again. This is not true for east and west. How could this have been known when King David wrote this around 1000 B.C.? This is the theme for today's show, scientific facts and their application long before they were discovered by modern man. Let's get started with our discussion of science and the Bible. Pastor John? Oh, thank you, Dr. Ford. I've been so excited about this one. <laughs> yes, awesome. I love geeking out over <laughs> facts in the Bible. Now, for those of you who are just tuning in, maybe you didn't pick up from the prior weeks, we have been studying about the history of the Bible, and we wrapped up that study, but what we wanted you to take away from it is seeing how God's infallible, inerrant, perfect word has been given to us as an instruction handbook for life, and not just to operate your day-to-day -day living by, but to behold the awesomeness of God, really, to just bask in how amazing He is, that He created everything from nothing, that He has woven this tapestry and every thread perfectly for the grand weaver's hand to be on all factors of life, every thought, every decision, every action he has already seen before time began, and he's weaving everything to a perfect conclusion where it was always about Jesus Christ. His first coming, his second coming, his creating, he, his selecting his bride, his bringing his bride unto himself, his new kingdom that will be to come for a thousand years on the earth, and then a new heaven and a new earth to follow. We won't even scratch the surface with the 31,100 verses that are in the God's holy word, because we're going to be learning even forever and ever beyond that. That's how awesome God is. So we just <laughs> geek out when we get to open God's word and Amen. see things unfold there that modern science perhaps started to figure out many generations later. And they were so excited by those discoveries only to find out, wait a minute, the Bible talked about that a thousand years before it ever was discovered by man. So that's what we want to talk about today is just to geek out with you a little bit and with the intent that when you hear these things, it only affirms your reliance on God's holy word to say it is filled with knowledge of all things. If you want to learn about agriculture, it's there. You want to learn about science, it's there. You want to learn about modern medicine even, it's there. So ultimately, you can then trust it to say with all wisdom that it entails, I can apply these things to my life and will have success. And ultimately, you'll have success spiritually because you will know Jesus Christ, our Lord. You will know his heart and he's given you then all these details so that you know how to spend money rightly. You know how to live rightly and you will have success in all spheres of your life. You'll be the best parent you could possibly be. You'll be the best spouse you can possibly be. It's all there in God's holy word. So, of course, we can just spend all day just talking about how <laughs> awesome that is. Let me just throw out some fun things for you. And that's what we want to talk about. Dr. Ford and I are just going to banter a little bit and you yep. get to chime in and, and hear us uh, banter and geek out over sciencey things in the Bible. Uh, one in particular, and let me just start with this one. We know that the Earth is free-floating in space. Now, we understand it has a gravitational poles and so forth, and it's rotating as it spins on its axis around the Earth, around the Sun, rather, and, and, and all the, the factors that hold the entire solar system together. We've talked a little bit about that in the past, of how everything has a perfect gravitational pole that keeps the Earth exactly where it is so that it spins at just the right speed, at just the right angle 
and the seasons that happen. And so all of this is required to sustain life on this planet. That is awesome in and of itself. But Earth's free floating in space was not always known to man. In fact, at one point, <laughs> this sounds a little silly, but at one point, people actually thought that the Earth was just on the back of a giant animal and, and it was being carried somehow and perhaps it was just flat or, you know, some sort of accoutrement to a giant beast. And, uh, and maybe we were just these small creatures on another larger creature. I mean, you can go back through some of the theories of old and you'd just be astonished how men considered the place on which we dwell. But in Job chapter 26, verse seven, which was written about thirty five hundred years ago, he says he stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He had already refuted by God's holy word any of those fallacies of the various pagan religions on the earth. And you can go back even to some ancient Buddhism and some of its theories, and you always get the image of the giant elephant and and us being a part of this giant elephant. But the Bible proclaimed that the earth freely floated in space despite all of those pagan religions. So there's one. So yeah. we start there. There's at least one science evident <laughs> evidence <laughs> 3,500 years ago already telling us that the earth was free floating in space by God's perfect design. All I could think of when you were talking about the ancient contradiction to that was Horton hears a who, you know, a <laughs> <laughs> right. similar right. sort, of, sort of idea. Well, the Bible also tells us that blood is the source of life. In Leviticus 17.1, this was written 3,500 years ago. It states, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, up until about 200 years ago, many of us know who read history, sick people were bled and many died because of the practice. This may have contributed to the death of George Washington. We Mm -hmm. now know that blood not only carries oxygen from the lungs throughout the body, but also provides nourishment to the cells It removes waste materials, and it even maintains body temperature. If you lose enough of your blood, you will lose your life. It's simple as that. Once again, the Bible is true long before man knew. Wow. That's incredible. Okay, let me throw another one out there. All right. I mean, you know, everything we're talking about today is going to help you win a trivia contest someday. (laughs) So you need to know these things, right? Well, rather, it it is designed, the, the whole discussion today, just to make you go, wow. Yeah. Look how awesome the Bible is, already revealing things before men ever caught up to it. And then somebody claimed that knowledge, go, look what I have discovered. You know, I, I did all this work and I discovered this mm-hmm. and then only to read the Bible and go, oh, wow, it said that almost 4,000 years ago. I can't believe I'm just now figuring <laughs> this out. Thunder. <laughs> how about the earth being round? Oh, boy, this is a big topic of discussion today. There is all these uh, the chatter on social media these days about uh, the earth being flat, and uh, that, that topic never seems to go away. And people then discuss, well, what does that mean when you get to the edge? Is water just falling off into space somewhere? Or are we surrounded by the Antarctic, which is actually some barrier that completely surrounds the earth, and you just run into a giant iceberg at some point, no matter which direction you go. And so we're like the saucer spinning out in space somewhere surrounded by ice. Uh, There's all kinds of theories, right? Well, the earth being round is actually found in the Bible. And you go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, again, written 2,800 years ago. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. It's also cited in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 27, and talking about this ball-shaped earth earth that we are on. The Bible informs us that the earth is round. Though it was once commonly believed the earth was flat, it was the scriptures that inspired Christopher Columbus to sail around the world. He wrote, it was the Lord who put it into my mind. There is no question the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous illumination from the Holy Scriptures. So the earth is round. (laughs) Well, here's another, another medical one. Let's talk about blood clotting. So even before Leviticus, back in Genesis, in Genesis 17, 12, we read, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male child in your generation. So have you ever thought, what's so special about the eighth day? Well, medical science has discovered that blood clotting in a newborn reaches its peak on the eighth day. Hmm. By that point, the coagulating factors in the blood are at optimal levels. Vitamin K does not reach sufficient quantity until day seven, and day eight is when prothrombin, another clotting factor, is at the highest, reaching 110% of the normal levels. Once again, another medical discovery by the Bible, thousands of years before modern man knew. 
Oh, love that. That's awesome. Okay, let me throw out another one. Laws of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics, you ready for this? Okay, so in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, after creation, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Finished. Okay, so the Hebrew word used here is the past definite tense for the verb finished. It indicates an action completed in the past, never again to occur. So creation was finished once and for all. That is exactly what the first law of thermodynamics says. This law also referred to the law of the conservation of energy and or mass states that neither matter nor energy can be either created or destroyed. There is no creation ongoing today. It is finished exactly as the Bible states. Wow, that is just absolutely incredible. This is uh, another another medical aspect that we have, the laws of hygiene. Once again, we're going to back to Leviticus. It says, And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and bathe his body in running water. Then he shall be clean. Well, until the 1800s, doctors washed their hands in a basin of still water over and over and over again, going from patient to patient without washing their hands under running water. This resulted in the spread of infectious disease from one patient to another. For medical practitioners today, hand washing under running water is an essential part of staving off the spread of disease. Once again, we see thousands of years before a modern man. Wow. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I love this. I hope you, as you're listening to this broadcast, you're already just geeking out with us because it's like, wow, look at this. This is incredible. And Dr. Ford, we've talked about this of just how the age of discovery, even through archaeology today, has lent to rediscovering things that were quite commonplace even for what we deem as ancient societies right. i mean you know look at the pyramids in egypt and so forth how often we talk about well where are the tools that they use to build these things how do they align them so perfectly with constellation patterns and so forth uh, did they understand things about even levitation and whatnot to be able to use harmonic frequencies and whatnot to be able to move large uh, giant bricks. I mean, you, you go to the Temple of Baalbek in Lebanon and you've got bricks there, single bricks that are like half the size of the Washington Monument. Wow. And would have taken perhaps 10,000 people to move a single brick to build a pagan temple, quite frankly. Some speculated, well, was that the land of the giants of the Philistines? Were they also used in moving some of those large bricks? There's so much about ancient technology, if you will, we just don't understand. What we do know seems to correlate with this, that wherever there was demon worship going on, there seemed to be a, a swift advancement of knowledge, not knowledge to better mankind, but rather to advance uh, perhaps this unseen world's agenda. Right. And we, we talk about that because in Daniel, we've mentioned, you know, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, and they weren't images of a literal man, but rather a spiritual influence, a demonic influence over nations, over kingdoms of men. And they're clashing against one another, almost like a spiritual game of risk, you know, one kingdom versus another and God moving all of that too. And so even Satan thought that he owned all the kingdoms of men and manipulated them to his own outcome and desires. Yet it all belongs to God. Ultimately, Amen. the reason why I bring this up is because we find things throughout antiquity that go, wait a minute, how did they have knowledge of that at that time? As if rather than saying that men were this, uh, you know, <laughs> ignorant, foolish being that barely could light a fire and had no knowledge of anything and just slowly accumulated knowledge. And we see the, the scale increasing over time of the amassing of information. Sometimes what we find throughout antiquity is that there were large bursts of knowledge that would be lost and another burst of knowledge and lost. I mean, you think about some of the libraries of antiquity we've talked about yeah. with the library in Alexandria or Ephesus. And amassing that kind of knowledge of what was lost over time, uh, you know, God, it seems like he has been the throttle controlling individual in all of this, you know, almost as saying not yet, right. the things that you've learned yet, not yet, and, and holding back some of those things. And then we find that in these latter days, knowledge has increased all the more at an exceptional expedient rate. 
And so the reason why I bring all this up is because the Bible has always been the consistent source throughout human history. Now, as we go back to 1445 BC, when the Torah was penned by Moses, ever since it's giving us understanding of things that men are just now starting to figure out. I mean, even understanding about the human genome and and DNA is a, and all the constructs that are in. I mean, a lot of these things are already in the Bible and it was written almost in code. And then you start to pull that out and you go, wow, look at what is here. God is the true source of all knowledge, knowledge that benefits us, not knowledge that harms us. And let me let me throw out some others. A uh, second law of thermodynamics comes into play here. In Psalm 102, verses 25 to 26, we read, Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment. So the Bible tells us three times that the earth is wearing out like a garment. This is what the second law of thermodynamics, which is the law of increasing entropy, states that in all physical processes, every ordered system over time tends to become more disordered. Everything is running down. It's wearing out as energy is becoming less and less available for us. That means the universe will eventually wear out something that wasn't discovered by science until really fairly recently. So, you know, as we think about that, uh, that's what sin is. Mm -hmm. Sin is the introduction of entropy into the created order of things. So when we look at even creation itself, this is why evolution is, is such a lie. Something of disorder doesn't create order. And that's what sin introduced was entropy, that things that were created with order and structure in perfect design by God are actually wearing out. You need only to look in the mirror to see that, right? We're, right. we're wearing down. The, the earth that we stand upon is wearing down. The universe all around us is wearing down. That's the second law of thermodynamics, which gives us the evidences of exactly what the Bible had already decreed. And, and so we see all of that going on around us as well. I don't, I don't know if Dr. Ford, you other any other science <laughs> facts you want to throw at us, I but I got a whole bunch of them. I here. do have another science fact all as, right, a matter, as a matter of fact, laws of quarantine. Ooh, good one. I thought this was really interesting. Once again, we're back into Leviticus and it reads all the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Well, laws of quarantine were not instituted by modern men until the 17th century. During the devastating Black Death of the 14th century, patients who are sick or dead were kept in the same room as the rest of the family. This is the way it had been for hundreds of years. The epidemics were attributed to bad air or evil spirits. Careful attention to the medical commands of God as revealed in Leviticus would have saved untold millions of lives. It's interesting, you know, we had talked about, I'd mentioned George Washington before, and I I used to read a lot about uh, him and the Founding Fathers, and I remember uh, him looking back into the rules in in Leviticus when they were setting up camps and sanitation. They actually went Mm -hmm. to the Old Testament to try to figure out how to do this properly, how to stave off disease. So they were using the Bible for setting up their own encampments with with these sort of things in mind. Well, you know what, if we actually did what the Bible tells us to do, it's amazing how well (laughs) it would go with us. I think, you know, the health that you think about with Moses, yes, it was a supernatural thing, but it was also when you eat right, according to the biblical guidance for how to eat, Moses was 120 years old and he didn't lose his physical strength until the day the Lord said, you're coming home. Right. Uh, And that's an amazing uh, declaration there that when you think about uh, like the year of Jubilee, or the, the when you go through the seven year rotation and then you would have a, a year of rest and then you would go into the Jubilee cycles as well. And you would have this time when you would let the ground, the soil rest and you'd live off what God had provided. And he basically put that out there to test them. Will you trust me in this? I will provide for you. Even in the Jubilee cycles, he'd give them two years of provision so that the land would rest and what it produced was enough for them to live on and be able to replant in time for the next cycle. But again, they had to trust God with these things. Now, if they did that, the soil would be more filled with the nutrients that they would need to sustain. Today, we learn about all different types of crop rotation and uh, the ways to be able to irrigate crops. And a lot of that came out of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of knowledge that still comes out of that region today that impacts us around the world. I mean, you can 
Think about all the Nobel Peace Prizes and so forth that have been, and all sorts of Nobel Prizes that have been won out of Israel, sure. and the knowledge that God had given to his people that have impacted and ultimately blessed all the nations of the earth. But it's all been right there in God's holy word if we would just yeah. do it. it. And that's true of everything, right? <laughs> it's so interesting. It's just a segue into this anti-Semitic time that we find ourselves in. The number of people of Jewish origin that have blessed the world with their discoveries, whether it's, you know, medicine, science, entertainment, music, whatever it may be, uh, the, the people of God have blessed humanity for generations and generations with the things that they've contributed. And I think we need to we need to be aware of that. We need to thank God for that. That's right. Well, it again, just shows that God is the author of knowledge that benefits mankind and benefits his children. If we will listen to him, if. We call ourselves a Christian, then all the more, not only will the Bible benefit us to guide us spiritually, but in a physical world, we will do better if we only adhere to his instruction. Here's another one that's quite fun. Uh, Countless stars, you know, Jeremiah 33, 22, it was written 2,500 years ago, says, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. The Bible asserts that there are countless stars. It's described here as the host of heaven. When this statement was recorded, no one knew how vast the stars really were. There were fewer than 1,100 that were actually observed. That's as many as Ptolemy was able to catalog. Now we know that there are countless billions of stars. I think it was NASA that said one septillion or something like that. That means that they just start throwing words out there. That means they just gave up. (laughs) They just quit counting because there were so many. Some say it's 10 to the 25th power and you still wouldn't be able to count them all. So there, science is just now catching up to the reality of just how many stars are out there when the Bible was already telling us that 2,500 years ago. Just how many and and just in our final couple minutes together, what I want you to think about is this, the the reality of the Bible giving us predictions of things when we call prophecy that weren't just guesses. They were foretelling of something that was going to happen, absolutely going to happen. We think about the thirty five hundred prophecies, thirty five hundred, three hundred and fifty five prophecies of Jesus's first coming. And then we have well over 1,500 plus of his second coming. And so we have all of these prophecies and the 355 that Jesus fulfilled at his first coming is a mathematical impossibility. It just can't happen that you would have that many prophecies come to pass exactly as foretold. So I I want you to consider that when, when we look at those kind of numbers, maybe I can find something here that we can relate with, but you know, when you look at the mathematical odds of that, I believe it was Ray Comfort who said, uh, he said it like this. He said it would be 10 to the 17th power that you would even be able to fulfill, say, eight or nine of those 355 prophecies. So that's the probability. It'd take the number 10 and write 17 more zeros after that, that you could fulfill all of those and, and just say eight of those. So he said, uh, this is what he says. Let's try to imagine the likelihood that if we took the number of silver dollars and it's the number 100 with like three, six, nine, twelve, oh, fifteen 12, oh, 15 zeros <laughs> after that. He said, then draw a black X on only one of them and lay them over the state of Texas that would cover the entire state two feet deep. Now, blindfold a man and tell him to travel as far as he wishes, then pick up only one silver dollar, and it must be the marked one. What chance would he have of picking up the right one? It would be exactly the same odds that just eight of the messianic prophecies would all come true in any one person, yet they all came true in Christ. And that's just eight of the 355. So when we start throwing out these fun Bible facts like that, and, and, and you, know, you could, let's even in, in just a moment, consider the fact that when he talked about the birth of Israel, the rebirth of a nation, not only would it be come to pass, that it would become a nation the first time, but then to be reborn on May 14th, 1948, after the British mandate, after all of those things, 25 biblical prophecies concerning that literally came to pass real time, right before everyone's eyes. The chance of that being fulfilled is less than one in 33 million. 
right? So, I mean, it's just astronomical. It's an awesome thing when you consider, when you look at God's holy word and you see all the wisdom, all the instruction, all the prophecy. And we're talking about the Bible is filled with almost 33% of it related to prophetic matters. And so we're talking thousands that are encompassed there. The Bible is our handbook. It is God's holy word. And I think that's what we wanted to geek out today and just look at this and go, look at just even the science that's revealed in God's holy word. So I hope you've been encouraged today. If anything, you have a big smile on your face and you go, (laughs) my Bible is awesome. But more importantly, my God is awesome. Yahweh is awesome. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is awesome. And if you want to know him as your personal Lord and Savior, please reach out to us today. Get to know Jesus Christ, and you will know him deeper through his word. We're happy to walk you through that. You can reach out to us at Calvary Fellowship, Fountain Valley Church. You can find us online at calvaryfountain.com. Services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends. Take care.